One of my favorite things that we get to do as a church, and we've done for over a decade, is we do a week at Camp Wainema for our high schoolers. And Camp Wainema is this beautiful place on the Oregon coast that is a camp that we go to. And what I love about camp is that these camps, when I was a kid, I went to a few And then when I became a Christian, I I went more as an adult. But I feel like I got the same experience as kids did. When you're at camp, over this week, you feel this closeness with your friends. You feel a closeness with your spiritual leaders. And most importantly, you feel this intimacy and closeness with God in a unique and fresh way. And, And when I was thinking about this sermon... In this series, in this series, let me back up for a second. We're in this series called Mythical Gods. And what we want to do is take the God that we had, the image of God that we had of our, in our childhood, or maybe a non-believer would have about the God that we worship, and, and just identify that that low-resolution, unclear God of our childhood doesn't play out in our adult life. And I think a lot of our conflict and understanding is when we try to take our our childhood understanding of God and figure out how does this play out in real life. Like we talk first talk about the superhero God, the God that protects us, the bodyguard God, the, the, the God that wraps us in bubble wrap. And if we're in his will, nothing bad ever happens to us. That God doesn't exist. But that's a childhood perception of God. So then if we take that childhood perception of God into adulthood and we see suffering, we see pain, our tendency is just to reject all, God altogether because we're rejecting this childhood conception of God. These conceptions of God are nowhere in the Bible, but it's this childhood view of God. Today we're talking about my BFF God, or Jesus, my homeboy God. Uh, Jesus is my homeboy. Is, I don't know, you probably saw the t-shirts back in the day. Um, and I'll, let me tell you where I've gone on this journey about Jesus as my homeboy. When I was young, and I felt like the religious people in my church were squashing my relationship with God with their religiosity. And I was trying to worship God despite their judgment and condemnation and control. Jesus as my homeboy got me through. It got me to claim that Jesus is close to me. I have a personal relationship with a personal Jesus. Now, now that I'm in my 50s, I look back at Jesus as my homeboy and I get frustrated. I'm like, how dare you remove the reverence and fear of God from your definition of God? And, and then I stop myself like, am I becoming the man? Like, <laughs> am I the man now? <laughs> like, I was not the man when I was 19 and 20. Am I the man? Uh, because I see the beauty of the value of the reverence of God. But rather than just stand on one side or the other, what I want to do is look at the utility and maybe the heart. Maybe, maybe there's a pure heart behind Jesus as my homeboy that might be a little misguided. And maybe there's a pure heart by Jesus as holy and we should fear him that might be true but a little misguided. And let's find the beauty of unity in all of this and give people a lane and and. and you know, I always like to say this. It's like we're bowling and we're, we're going to put the bumper gutters or the gutter bumpers up, right? To make sure that we stay in the lane. So the Jesus is my homeboy feeling. I think that feeling, I think, I know I do and, and I think we all do. We kind of long for that intimacy and that closeness that we felt from God in those moments. And maybe it's not a camp for you. Maybe it was a conference. Maybe it was a moment alone with God. Maybe you're on a boat fishing and you just felt his overwhelming presence. But, but I think we all long for that deep-rooted knowledge and understanding that God is with me. He is present. And you feel close. You feel like he's your, your friend because he accepts you and he loves you. One of our favorite stories in the Bible that depict this is this story that Heather read about the, um, the Samaritan woman at the well. And I want to break down why I think we really like this story, why we really relate to this story. So let's pray, and then we're going to get into that story and talk about this, this balance of Jesus being holy and Jesus being my friend. Heavenly Father, you're good and you're gracious, and I thank you so much for your word. I thank you that this story of this woman at this time and this place was preserved for us to see your relationship with this woman and how it relates to us and reveals to us your character, your nature, 
and it calls out of us a response. So God, I pray that you would direct this conversation, you would direct your scripture as it, as it speaks to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, if you don't know me, my name is Mike. I get to be the pastor of Village Church. We've been out here for uh, officially launched a little over a year ago as we're developing our new, new systems and new church. Uh, we just want to thank you for being here. Thank you for joining us online. Uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful thing. Online church has become a very useful tool for us, and we're just grateful for you being with us today. This story about this woman at the well, it resonates with us for a few reasons. One, this, the way Jesus relentlessly pursues uh, closeness with this woman, a, a conversation that leads to an invitation and leads to a deep understanding and a, an acceptance of who she is, and, and it's just really beautiful. I think it connects with us. First of all, in this story, we see that Jesus is alone talking to a woman, which was he shouldn't have done that according to social norms, but we see Jesus breaking through these gender role barriers that were up. He just he doesn't respect them. He pushes through them, right? And we want a God that does that. We want a God that reaches through those barriers to be in relationship with us. The, the other thing we see is this woman is a Samaritan, which is a known like rival or enemy of the Jews. And so Jesus breaks through political barriers, and pushes through to be in this conversation with this woman. The next thing we see in verses 17 through 19, this woman just has a shady past. She she's, has a questionable moral fiber, you would say. She has done things that she has resentment and shame about. And Jesus breaks through those moral barriers. And then she asks this unique question. She says, Basically, you're a Jew, I'm a Samaritan. The Jews say that we worship on this mountaintop. We say we worship over here. The Messiah will come and figure that all out. And Jesus breaks through religious barriers. All those things that we put up uh, with each other and these assumptions we make that, that God can't accept me because I'm different. God can't accept me because I'm made different, wired different. God can't accept me because I've sinned and I fail. God can't accept me... And Jesus just breaks, I think that just makes our soul sing because we all know that we do things to separate ourselves from God. We all know that we are not God and we all long for that feeling of intimacy with him. And then Jesus just comes into this woman's world, shatters all these barriers to be in relationship with her, to make her a very specific invitation. And Jesus says something very specific that... It's the first time in the Gospel of John that we see Jesus use this, this term. This, uh, in the Greek, it would be ego emi, where he says, I am. And this is the exact same way that the uh, Greek translators of the Septuagint translated the Hebrew, where Moses uh, is, is afraid to go talk to Pharaoh, and he asks God, who do I say sent me? And God says, ego emi. He says, I am. So Jesus is pulling that declaration of I am the Messiah, I am God into this interaction. And he does this many times throughout scripture where he says I am. And he makes this declaration that yes, and this is, this is the tension that we're trying to navigate here today. Yes, I am with you, I'm for you, I'm breaking through these barriers and I am the holy God. Because I think that's the difference between your best friend, your homeboy, and God. You know, uh, when I was in high school, uh, I was just learning what it means to be a Christian and what it looks like, and uh, make that caveat. <laughs> but uh, I had a best friend. I still have, he's still one of my best friends today, probably my longest standing best friend. Um, his name's Dave. Uh, hey, Dave. Uh, I hope you're okay if I tell this story, but because in this one, I look bad and you look good, so I won't tell the other ones. Uh, no, I, I, we were in high school, probably senior year in high school, and I went to a party, and Dave didn't go to a party. Uh, that tells you who made the better decisions of the two of us. And uh, I wake up, I fall asleep because we drank too much, and I woke up at like 3 or 4 a.m., and I call my friend Dave because I locked my keys in the car, and who's the only person that has a spare key to your car when you're 17? Your best friend. You're not giving a key to your parents. <laughs> so my best friend had a key to my car. So I called him 3.34 in the morning. And back then I called him on what, what, how they say landline. 
Uh, and uh, he didn't have, didn't have cell phones, and so I called him on land, and I, which meant his parents had to answer the phone. His dad is Dr. Darrell Guter, who's one of my favorite authors and theologians today. He was the dean of theological studies at Whitworth, Element, or Whitworth uh, um, College in Spokane, where I grew up. And then he later became the dean at Princeton University, and now he's retired. Some of you who interned with us, you went with me. We, he, he received us, and we got to have lunch with him and interview him and get to know some of his writings. And Anyway, I didn't know he was so great back then. He was just an odd guy that had strange religious jokes. Uh, do you want one? I don't know if you'll get it. I didn't get it at 17. He said, you know, when I get a, if I ever get a new, another dog, I'm going to name him Maddox. And I said, why? Because then I can say, this is my dog Maddox. <laughs> See, imagine being 17 going, you're just weird, man. <laughs> so he answers the phone. 3.34 in the morning. And he's the kindest guy. Hi, Dr. Gooder. This is Mike. Full of shame. Hi, Mike. Can I talk to Dave? Yeah. So he goes and wakes up Dave. Dave has to come up to the phone because the phone used to be attached to the wall, right? So Dave had to get out of bed, come up to the phone, and he goes, Dave, it's Mike. He's on the phone for you. And Dave's first words, I hate you. <laughs> <laughs> like, Hey, man, I'm at a party. I like my keys in the car. I'm already full of shame. Will you come get me? And Dave just, he's there in 10 minutes. He just, yeah, I'll be right there. No question other than, I hate you. (laughs) And that was that acceptance. Because in a way, Dave broke through my shame, broke through my barriers, didn't condemn me for being an idiot, and came and helped me when I needed him, right? That's what a best friend does. But Dave, I didn't ask Dave for forgiveness. I didn't call Dave and say, I betrayed my commitment to you, oh, mighty best friend Dave. I failed. I gave in to sin, and I need you to forgive me, and I repent. Like, that's not Dave. I don't have expectations of my best friend that he's going to redeem me, restore me, forgive me, and he's not the one I go to with a repentant heart for the salvation of my soul in the moment where I need the redemption. There's a big difference between a BFF who accepts you and the almighty holy God who accepts you. And it's rooted in that Jesus is God. Where he says, ego emi. Jesus goes through in other other teachings and uses this I am statement to declare who he is. He says, I am the bread of life. I am the light of the world. I am the door. I am the good shepherd. I am the resurrection and the life. I am the true and living way. I am the vine. I am he. If I had a best friend that said those things, we probably wouldn't be best friends. That's just, you're crazy. But I don't want to dismiss the felt need that we have that says, I need God to accept me for who I am. I need God to be with me. I need God to love me. I need God to to go into the trenches with me. I need God to be present. The relationship with God, the friendship with God is holy in itself. It's set apart from any relationship we have. Now, how do we get back to that? How do we claim that? Because I think we all long for that feeling. Let's go back to my story about camp. There is a reason why. At camp, we feel intimacy with God. We feel closeness with God. We feel like he's present. Like I I know people, and I I even feel that. Like if I go to Camp Wainema, it's my favorite place to go. Every time Heather and I need to go for a a retreat, some time of prayer and fasting to seek God's will, we go to Wainema. The ground isn't physically holy, but to us, we have felt God's presence there so much, we go there. And here's why I believe those memories of camp, those times at camp, we feel that closeness with God. It's nothing magical about the ground, but think about what you do with your daily life every time you're at camp. If you've never been to camp, listen to this. This is what it's like. You wake up in the morning and you start with a prayer meeting. And then you do a devotional every day. And then maybe midday you have a time of worship and fellowship with people. And you're talking about what you studied that morning, what you read that morning, as you, or what God spoke to you that morning when you were praying. 
And then you go into your afternoon, you have fun fellowship with your friends, all rooted in, in the character of Jesus and being kind to one another. You're playing games and doing activities where k- kindness and acceptance and love and patience is the, the spirit of the game and the day. And then you go at night and you worship together and you hear an inspiring word from God that where the Bible is read and something is preached. And then you go to bed with a, a bonfire prayer meeting. I promise you, If you structure one week of your life like that, there will be an intimacy and closeness with God that you will live in. That's why every preacher worth anything will tell you, read your Bible, pray, fellowship with believers, serve others, develop your character, obey Jesus, because it's in that where we feel that intimacy and closeness. It's nothing magical about camp, but there is something magical about spiritual rhythms that draw your heart and make you feel his closeness. So if you're feeling distant from God, I can promise you, you're not spending time with him in worship and prayer and and study of the scriptures and, and humble repentance before him and honest dialogue. That closeness, that intimacy, that's the beauty behind the bad theology of Jesus is my homeboy, right? It's bad theology, but the beauty behind that is this closeness and intimacy with God that I think we need to embrace, be gracious with people who need to say, Jesus is my homeboy, and acknowledge there's an intimacy there that they're trying to capture, that God bless them, but know that that, the path to that intimacy is through spiritual rhythms. And I'm not the first to say this. This has been taught for thousands of years. The spiritual rhythms in your life Determine your closeness to God. God is more than our best friend. So there is a balance here. There's a balance that we're trying to say, Jesus is holy and he is my friend. Jesus calls us his friends. He says, you are no longer my servants, you are my friends. Why does he do that? He's not saying you're no longer my servants, you're my peers. It's now that you know what I am here to do, you are here to do it with me. You're not just here to do what I tell you in everything. You're here to take what I'm here to do and go do it. And he gives us the great commission. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you, but don't be afraid because I'm with you. I'm with you to the very end. Jesus is with us. He is is for us. And he is holy. And, And... Holy means set apart. And and here's the nuance on the other side. Holy means set apart, but it doesn't mean set apart from us. It doesn't mean that it makes God distant. And I think that's where we get wrong on the holiness side, where, where we say we have to treat God as holy and make him distant as if it's something other than. And we do this all the time because we're scared. Like this happened to me when when I spent 17 years in the technology industry and when I retired from that to pursue ministry, it was like a six-year process of me praying and seeking and moving in the direction of of getting out of that field. I had a friend that came to me and he he and I were close. We're both entrepreneurs, business people. Um, He's still a friend today, but and I tease him about this, but he came to me and we had coffee and he's like, man, I don't know, man, I, I just... I see what you're doing and you, and then this weirdness started happening. We were peers. And then all of a sudden he said, but you, man, the way you do this is so much greater than me. And, and you have this responding to God's calling. Your ability to obey God is so much beyond mine. And I see your giftings. I don't have the giftings you do. And he starts separating us in his mind and starts elevating me and putting me on this pedestal. And after a few weeks of this, I saw what was happening and we got together once and I said, you need to stop it, man. Because I believe what you're doing is you are separating me from you so you don't have to hear God call you to do something radical. You're trying to separate me as some, I'm no better than you. This guy's way more talented than I, he's way nicer than me. He's kind, he's generous, he's faithful, he's smart and he's a or he gets stuff done and God has a role for him equally powerful role to go and respond in a radical way to the calling of Jesus but to separate it's like created this 
weird distance in our relationship. God isn't, we, God isn't calling us to call him holy and separate ourselves from him. He says, now I am holy, therefore you be holy too. He wants us to be in holiness with him. Now, none of us are holy, but what do we believe Jesus did? Do we believe that we are worms and God is holy? Or do we believe that Jesus sacrificed on the cross, the resurrection from the grave, redeemed us from sin and shame and makes us holy? We are in the process of becoming holy. This is what sanctification is. We're in the process. And in that process, Jesus is with us along the way. Do not fear. The most repeated command in all of Scripture, Old Testament and New, is do not fear. And the reason given is always some version of, for I am with you. The holy God is with us and for us and redeems us and restores us unto righteousness. So when we come to God in repentance and ask for forgiveness, the forgiveness is already there. This isn't some transaction that we initiate with God when we repent and we say, God, now will you manufacture forgiveness for me as I repent? While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. The repentance or the forgiveness is extended to us. Now we live in the freedom of forgiveness when we repent. But we're not asking for him to manufacture a new assertion of forgiveness. He has already declared that. That's the good news. So are we willing to humble ourselves and repent is the question. And it's true in your relationships, right? If you're in a relationship with someone and you have a conflict and they say, I forgive, and you apologize and they say, I forgive you. If you don't believe that they actually forgive you, do you enjoy the freedom of being forgiven? You don't. Or if you're too proud to accept the fact that someone is forgiving you, you don't enjoy being set free in forgiveness, but their heart may have forgiven you. But if you don't believe it and you don't receive it, you can't live it. You can't experience it. It's the same with God. The forgiveness is there. Do you believe that God is more than your best friend? Do you believe that he is someone who has the authority and the desire and the love for you to forgive you and to restore you? Do you believe that? That's what we're invited to believe and to live in. And that's where we'll feel the intimacy with God. And I think the balance is perfect here. In Psalm 25, 14, this is the, 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 the psalm that just puts this into perspective. Where it says, the friendship of the Lord is for those who fear him. And he makes known to them his covenant. Now in Jeremiah 34, we learn what is this covenant where the prophet declares, where where God says through the prophet that this is what will define the new covenant of my people. He says, here's what defines them. I will write my word on their heart. They will know me. They will know this longing for me. They will long for this friendship with me. And then he says, and I will forgive them. So his forgiveness And our knowledge of our need for forgiveness is what defines us as God's people. He makes known to them his covenant. God loves you with an everlasting love. Even if right now you're not feeling the closeness. Even right now you realize I haven't been praying. I haven't been spending time with God. I feel distant from him. The answer isn't to sit in Christian guilt that you're not doing it right. The answer is to, as we focus on prayer today in our response time, is to go before the Lord in your heart and truly repent and receive his restorative forgiveness. And when you believe that you are forgiven, you will feel the closeness and the intimacy that we long for when we say, Jesus is my homeboy or Jesus is my best friend. That's how we can have closeness with a holy God. When Jesus says, I'm the way, truth, and the life, no man can come to the Father but by me, this is what he's talking about. There is no way to experience the closeness and intimacy with God without the repentant heart going to Jesus and and claiming the forgiveness that's offered. I'm going to ask the band to come back up. And and every every service, we have a response time, right? And we invite you to respond to God in, in, in one of four ways of just very healthy disciplines that we believe are important in our life. And today the response time is prayer. 
And uh, Toby's going to lead us through a prayer together. And uh, I'd like you to engage with this and just let the blood of Jesus, the, the beauty of the forgiveness of Jesus and the power of the resurrection restore you unto right standing with God so you can walk out of here feeling like Jesus is your best buddy and he's your friend and he's your savior and he's holy and he's inviting you to holiness. Let's declare that today. In Jesus' name, let it be. Amen. All right. Yeah, as we enter into response time, I'd love to just uh, lead us through a prayer that's based on uh, Ephesians chapter 3. And it's really just this prayer as a church saying, God, may you open up our hearts, open up our eyes, help us to understand the depth of your love and power and fullness of who you are. And so uh, I'm just going to read it somewhere if you want to put it on the screen. That'd be awesome. Um, And I'd love for you if you feel comfortable just to read that, read this with me. And we can pray this as a church to our God who's listening. So let's pray this together. For this reason, we bow our knees before the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant us to be strengthened with power through his spirit in our inner being, so that Christ may dwell in our hearts through faith, that we, being rooted and grounded in love, may have strength to comprehend with all the saints what is the breadth and length and height and depth, and to know the love of Christ that surpasses all knowledge, that we may be filled with all the fullness of God. Father, that is our prayer this morning, and I just ask that as we um, spend time in reflection and singing and um, just go into our week, God, that your presence, your holy presence with us would be uh, tangible and that you would draw us in, God, and that we'd be transformed by knowing you. Um, I pray that you would um, use us, God, and open doors for us to understand that deeper and share that with those around us. Um, In your name, Jesus. Amen.